Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 347 for Tuesday, June 14th, 2022. Greetings, folks, and Welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here, back here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. I, I gotta say, I, like, my uh, my Westone UM2s, which are these 15-year-old in-ear monitors uh, that I have used in the podcast studio for 15 years... The left one, like a week and a half, maybe two weeks ago, uh, the low end driver crapped out on it. And so for the moment, I am using my JH Audio Layla's here in the studio. And it's super freaking weird, man, because these have way more low end than I'm used to. And so like playing the theme music, even just hearing my voice talk, it, it's I'm, I'm like super thrown off. It, it's weird. Like you, you find not that these are bad or or those are good. It's I mean they're both good. It's just you know what what is home for you. I think Mike Dias at uh, when we had him on just before COVID started talked about you know for your for your in ear mix what is home what 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 you know what what do things sound like when it's normal for you and this is not home for me, Paul. It's weird, mm. man. But it's fine. Like you're, it's you know you're a sensitive fellow. I am a sensitive fellow. Yeah. Those Layla's are, are, uh, are those the highest end in ears that you own? Uh, they are the priciest in ears. And I would think, yeah, they are the highest end. I mean, I think they, they have 12 drivers per ear. Um, but Jer Jerry is aware that these have too much low end for me and is working on making a set of their new ones for me. So I'm, I'm eager to try those out too. I mean, like I said, they sound good. They're crystal clear. They just have a lot of low end that that I'm not used to when I'm sitting here in the in the podcast studio. So yeah, got it. Yeah. What are your main gigging in ears? The currently my main gigging in ears are the uh, Ultimate Ears Pro Eleven or Ultimate Ears Eleven Pro Ambience is is what I use live, and I I like those a lot. Um, I usually use them. Those are four drivers per ear. I usually use them with the ambient ports open just because it means that I don't have to have like ambient mics on stage to pick up, you know, conversation and stage wash and things like that. But, um, but yeah, those are, those are, those are home for me on stage for sure. I tried those here in the podcast studio, very different from the UM twos and the UM twos. Uh, when Jerry hears this, he'll get all freaked out because uh, as he mentioned, when he came on the show, he, when he, had started ultimate ears and through its, its growth process that there was a bit of an F you moment with West tone. And, and that's my term, although it wouldn't surprise me if other people involved use that same term, but, uh, but I, I am classifying it as an F you moment with, uh, with West tone that, that he had, that he told us about on the thing where they um, sort of took some customers, but um, the UM twos are essentially a clone of his, the, the first of his that I ever used, which were the UE five C's back, you know, 17 years ago. And I might still have a set of UE five C's somewhere here. And if I do, that's what I'm going to use in the studio. Now that I'm saying this out loud, I, I might have, I might have found a solution to my problem. So we'll get there. We'll get there. Mm -hmm. um, Paul, I, you know, we, it's been a couple of weeks since we've done this. I know you've been out and around. Uh, around the world, haven't you? I, I I literally was around the world. We went to Greece. It was a a my it, it started as a trip for my son's high school graduation, which happened in 2020. Uh, so we had two years to sort of plan and dream about this while we couldn't go anywhere. And we had this I, he had this idea of wouldn't it be cool to you know cruise the Greek Isles? And I was like, sure, that sounds great. Now, I never actually expected that it would come to fruition. I thought it would be canceled because of COVID, but. It, it was not. So we spent, yeah, we spent about four days in Athens, Greece, and then cruised around the, the Greek Isles uh, before winding up in effectively Venice where we flew home. 
And it was, yeah, it was 12 days. It was amazing. It, it, like I said, it started as a, as a graduation trip for him. It evolved into a bucket list trip for all of us. And in the interim, my daughter graduated from, from college, as you mentioned on the last episode. And so it was a graduation trip for both of them really. And, but just a, a wonderful trip for us all. I did notice something though, right before we left, you and I had a conversation on this show about sound and which instruments uh, would get in, you know, would compete with vocals and which wouldn't. And, and we, we, uh, we had a, and it, I'll call it an enjoyable moment of butting heads over, you know, guitars versus drums and which when they're too loud is, is too much. So I had that conversation in my head and it, it's important to, to preface this next part with that, because we all see through, see things through the lens that we're wearing at the time. Right. And I got on the cruise ship and there are bands on cruise ships as, as you know, there usually are. There were essentially two bands that uh, I saw it sort of interchangeably throughout the trip, the, the trip. There was a reggae band and then there was what I'll just call a rock band. Both of them were four pieces and never once through the entire cruise did I see a guitar. The, the rock band was keys, bass, drums, and a female vocalist, but there was a, the keyboard player w w was a guy that also sang, so they had male and female vocals. And the reggae band was keys, bass, drums, and vocals, a male vocalist. And I asked the, the keyboard player, you know, at one point, I'm like, it's interesting, no guitar. He's like, yeah, they, they decided that because guitars were the easiest thing to be too loud to get in the way of the vocals for <laughs> people to hear on the ship. <laughs> I was like, wow. That's amazing. I've been on cruises before. I've never seen this in the past. There's always been a guitar player. Like it's always, always, mm -hmm. always. It just seemed weird to me. And when I first saw it, I thought, oh, well, maybe the guitar players got COVID. I, you know, like that, that, that's a thing that happens these days, right? And, you know, maybe he's on board or not on board, isolating somewhere or something. And they're like, no, 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 no. They, they decided not to have guitars because it makes the sound way easier to do. Like, wow. Even for a rock band. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. I would like to say that keyboard players are at such a premium. I don't. I don't know. Do do kids not take piano lessons anymore? And and in the two markets that I've lived in over the last twenty years, keyboard players are the rarest beasts. Huh. And, and true true piano players, like like you know, people who can play two hand piano accompaniment music in rock bands is even rare. You, there are ones who pick up and kind of more approach it as more keyboards than piano. Like, yeah. like they understand sounds and, and uh, you know, sound creation, but real, real piano players are harder to find. Certainly like people who understand the essence of playing organ part, like B three parts is, is even rarer than that. But, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, it seems like a keyboard player would makes you, it, it's the most versatile sounds. Right. Yeah. Yes. A guitar player, a gu guitar player can comp and, you know, accompany a singer. But I would think that keyboard players would be, would add the most color to most types of groups. It, Do you, any of your bands not have a keyboard player? Well, it's interesting to your final point there that keys add the color to the group. We always said that Aaron was, you know, fling secret weapon, especially back in our, you know, heavy gigging days. And, and, Certainly part of that was the fact that he played keys and most of the time was playing piano. He would play organ parts or, uh, you know, uh, maybe a Rhodes or even sometimes, a you know, a synthesizer style part. But by and large, his default is to play piano and he does know how to play a piano with two hands and, and all of that. The other part of what makes Aaron our secret weapon is his vocal skills and all of that. But, but certainly having the piano in, in fling was a huge part of what set us apart from, you know, from the pack. Uh, as to whether I play in a band without a, a keyboard player right now, that's an interesting question because Billy Butler is one of the best piano players I've ever played with. Uh, and he and mm -hmm. I, you know, have locked in that way many times. The original Bitter Pill show that we did, the Brechton show that we did, you know, he was playing keys. And and for the original Bitter Pill show, we actually moved a, a baby grand into the tiny theater, the <laughs> player's ring. No, seriously. It was freaking amazing. It sounded great. Yeah. Um, but in Bitter Pill, he plays the cello as a bass. And we've done a couple of gigs where he's brought a keyboard out and and played. But 
By and large, no, Bitter Pill does not have a keyboard player. I, I, that's the wrong words to use. We absolutely have a keyboard player. We have a fantastic one. It's just that we don't have keyboards in the, in the, in the band on stage. So most people coming to see us would probably say Bitter Pill does not have a keyboard player, um, which is, you know, a, a, a not incorrect interpretation. <laughs> so, yeah. But, but you know, I, I, 10 years ago here in the Seacoast, I would have absolutely agreed with you that finding a, you know, a, a real keyboard slash organ player like you described was difficult. These days... It seems like most bands have a keyboard or an organ player. Now, as I'm thinking that through, it, you know, it there are a couple of them that play in half the bands on the Seacoast. So they, you, you, I, I think your point about them being the most versatile, the most, um, you know, the, the easiest to find work, I think it's true. But most bands... These days that I, I see have keyboard players. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is a change. That's an evolution over the last decade for sure. Yeah. Hey, speaking of keyboard players, it, uh, I'm going to share my, my buddy Nick in the yeah. house rockers with me. He had his keyboard stolen out of his car in his driveway a couple oh. weeks ago. The neighbor got a little bit of it on, on, uh, on some security video um, the, the good of the story is, um, musicians and the local music stores, you know, when he contacted the music store to say, he'd look out for this stuff if somebody sure. could trust to sell to you, um, we're all, you know, very supportive of, uh, Hey man, anything you need to borrow until you get things straight, you know, so that, that was the, the good of humanity. The bad of humanity, of, co of course, is the, is the stealing the stuff, but, um, yeah, it's crazy. And it's a reminder, you know, your home insurance probably doesn't cover your, your gear if you use it professionally. So, you know, you need to have some kind of special riders on your local, um, on your local, your, your home insurance. Uh, if you want your, if you want your gear covered, it's just, I know we did a, a show on insurance, but the, this is, you know, kind of smack dab in your face about how important it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I have a, I, the, the, Home insurance company that I have allows me to add a rider for a gear that right. I am using to make money. But that, but like you said, you have to do that. And not everyone will do it. I, I looked quickly in our our notes here, and it's Music Pro Equipment Insurance at. Yeah. Let me make sure I have the URL right. MusicProInsurance.com was the kind of the default that we mentioned that it that lo a lot of you told us about. So yeah, yeah, for sure, man. I'm sorry to hear that. That sucks. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yep, yep, yep. It happens. Yeah. Hey, I um I I I've I'm I'm a part of another one of these projects with my friend Stu. He calls it Diaspora Radio. Uh we did that Marvin Gaye record back in the fall and we're doing the Talking Heads Speaking in Tongues. Uh we had our first rehearsal last night and we're playing it next week at at the press room here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And it's he. It's interesting because most listeners, uh, as most people, know me as a drum set player. My introduction to Stu with music was a last minute thing where my friend John McCormick, who plays guitar and bitter pill, asked me to play congas for a uh, performance that he was doing, opening up a TEDx thing in Portsmouth. Because his conga player mm. backed out or I know, something happened. And he's like, hey, do you have congas? Can you do this? And I'm like, yeah, actually, yeah, sure. And so I did that. And that's, that was my first introduction to Stu, who was playing guitar and singing at that gig. And so Stu knows me as the percussion guy. And he brings me in to these projects as the percussion guy. I loved doing the Marvin Gaye gig with all the percussion and, and the harmony vocals and everything. It was That was really, I mean, I, I talked a lot about it. That was a great thing. The percussion on Speaking in Tongues, the Talking Heads record, is even better. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it is a blast. So I am very much looking forward to this. We've got a couple more rehearsals ahead of the performance next week. But, um, but it, yeah, it's, I mean, you know, that's a, that's a record. Well, it, like that record, that, for those of you who don't know the, the title of that record uh, or, and, and the significance of it, that is the record 
for which the Talking Heads were touring when they made the Stop Making Sense movie. So the Stop Making Sense movie was the Speaking in Tongues tour. And uh, and so it's got, you know, things like like Girlfriends Better and Burn Down the House and Making Flippy Floppy and Swamp and, you know, some uh, uh, and uh, uh, Naive Melody. Like so, uh, every song on this record is fantastic. But it really came together for the Talking Heads as a record where they finally, in my opinion, fused the sort of sounds of the time, the, the which was the 80s. With all the African influences and and soul and like seventies and sixties music inf- influences that that David Byrne sort of you know brought into things, and so because of that, so much of it really does follow what I call that African music aesthetic, where multiple parts make up the whole more so than you know in in sort of traditional rock and roll or what we know as, as rock and roll today, where there's just like, okay, you know, each person plays like this ostinato part that on its own is, you know, interesting, but, but certainly not enough to drive a song, but you put it all together and, you know, here's this part that, that just sort of comes out of the interplay between all of these, these separate things. And so we're leaning heavily into that Stu's Stu's always got a different vision for things and it can be a little jarring, uh, as a musician coming in at first, especially with a record that, uh, you know, I know so well. And he's like, OK, we're going to play this song like a like Funkadelic would play it. It's like, I don't like on the surface. I don't know that that's a good idea. Like, like these are pretty, you know, like these are songs that people know. Should we really be taking <laughs> huge liberties with a man? You know, but I've learned to go with it and then ask questions later and, and make suggestions later. And for the most part. His ideas actually, I think, are going to work out great. I mean, they're not, we're not taking them too far out, but there are moments where it's like, whoa, this is bold, but cool. And if we can deliver it, then it'll be cool. And I, and I think we'll be able to deliver it. He's got a great band uh, that he pulled together. So I'm psyched. I'm psyched about it. I'm, I'm curious to see how it evolves and if we have more than one performance and, you know, all of those things that sounds great. Yeah. It's fun. I don't know. It's something, <laughs> something different, right? Yeah. Um, should we do Eric's question, Paul? Yeah, because you have a long answer to that. I do. <laughs> I have a long answer to everything, man. Eric wrote us at feedback at giggabpodcast.com, where you are all welcome to write us. He says, um, Paul and Dave, he, he actually addressed it to you. He says, Paul, I'm looking at you on this one, but I'd love to hear what you both think is the best process to get the optimal live sound for acoustic acts on gigs. I'm sending this email during a break at a duo gig I'm playing, where, in my opinion, it sounds like we are playing through our noses. Looking at everything from the guitar to the mixer to the speakers, two vocal mics and one guitar, there's not much here to go wrong considering uh, I've done this two other times in the last three days. So what would be your step-by-step process for getting sounds? Do I start at the mixer with doing gain first? Do I do EQ first? Do I ride channel levels high? Or ride the master volume high? Do I ride the mixer master volume high? The powered speakers volume high? I have a slew of gigs coming up, and I would love to fine-tune my approach. So you're right. I, I, I wrote him a, a long response. I will, I will try and distill this down to the essence of it, because I'm, I'm definitely from the school of eliminate noise from the chain. And so for me, what that means is not adding gain at the end, because if you add gain at the end, you have a much greater chance of gaining noise in the signal up than you do signal, right? So thinking of signal to noise ratio, you want to, my, my approach is always get more signal up front so that you have less noise, right? Uh, and so to the, um, the, the way I start is, and, and it's, you know, I say that this is the way I start with digital mixers, a lot of this is different because rarely am I starting from scratch at any given gig. Like, you know, but this is how I would start with a band to get a set that I would then sort of program in and recall. Uh, but I would bring the channels and master levels all the way to all the way to the bottom. Um, and, and you can bring the gains all the way down too. And I would set my powered speakers at zero dB. So I'm not reducing anything from them, but I'm not adding anything to them. You might change that down the road, but that's sort of where I start. And then for each instrument, I gain it up uh, while the person is playing 
or singing at a, a good performance volume. I just turn the gain up. Nothing will be coming out of the speakers at this point, right? Because everything's down. But I'm turning the gain up to the point where it's peaking on the, on the gain meter. And then I'll back it off, you know, a few dB. I might even back it off another dB or two after that because I know that when someone's in performance mode, they're good. they might belt, they might play a little harder. And I don't want it to, you know, start clipping. So, uh, but, but the idea is to get as much into the gain as possible. That's what I do. I know there's other people that have different schools and I'd love to hear from you. In fact, I, I love learning this stuff and, and tweaking my approach too. So feedback at giggabpodcast.com. But I, I do that. I get the gains up. And, and then once that's there, I, I don't know. It, it, um, do you have anything to add at, at that point of things? Is this how you do it too, Paul? Or do you start? I remember, I don't do it. Oh yeah. So I don't, so I'm, I'm really just kind of, I'm just going to kind of listen and, okay. and, uh, and let you do this. This is your ball. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so I gain up all the instruments, you know, the, the, get the vocals to where they're not, you know, and, and to, they're not clipping. So they're not in the red on whatever your, your meters are. I would say that I get them up to, you know, about zero DB or maybe plus two DB, but with digital boards, that's what the meters show, but that's not what actually is happening. Because if you go past zero DB on digital, it actually distorts unlike analog. So there's these display meters that don't quite mean the same thing as the actual meters uh, inside. But, but that's, you know, that's about what I do. And you'll learn what works on your board as you do this a couple of times, but I get plenty of gain, plenty of signal in there. And then I always start with the monitors first at this point, because they're all part of the house mix. And so, you know, you're going to have the monitors on. So before I do the mains, I do the monitors, I get everything going. Uh, I bring the monitors up to maybe about like the monitor, the master monitor up to about negative three dB. I want to leave myself lots of headroom. And then I start bringing up the, uh, the channels while paying attention to the uh, EQ of the out, like the monitor output, the main EQ of the monitor output and I bring up, you know, the vocals to whatever, maybe, you know, again, negative 2 dB and the, and the instruments probably right about the same spot. It might be a little bit less, especially for an acoustic gig. And and then I listen and I also look if you've got a digital board, you probably have what's called an RTA or real time analyzer where you can see where the sound is on an EQ map. And and this is where I start looking for feedback and and I might take the main monitor thing and goose it like way up carefully to find where that first feedback point is and then use the parametric EQ to, to drop that out. And, and, you know, you might have to do that with, with two or three different EQ ranges. If you have to do it with more than that, well then everything's feeding back and, and you're, you're at the top. So you either like either that's your top end and you got to back off from it or you got to move speakers so that you're not feeding back as much or, or, you know, whatever that is. And then I do the same thing with the mains. And, uh, and then I'll, then I'll listen and maybe adjust the EQ of the channels to, to get things right. Um, and, and then that's kind of, that's kind of it. I mean, I, I realize that's a lot, but, but that's the, that's the process. So, uh, you know, I, the one thing I have learned, Paul, if I have a beer before I get to the end where I said, that's about it, I will regret it because yeah. how often do you ring out the room? Well, that is the ringing out the room, right? Like that, that's the, that process of, of sort of bringing the, the overall level of either the monitors or the mains all the, all the way up. And then even past where I plan to have it for the show, that is the ringing out of the room. And I'm, I can hopefully do it visually without too much feedback actually being, you know, produced from the speakers, although you're going to get some, you want to ride that carefully, especially if there's people in the room and you know, all that, but yeah, I, I ring out the room every time. Yeah. 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 Because, because otherwise you're going to regret it by song number three, you know, yeah. you're going to be, fight, it sucks to be fighting feedback while you're trying to play. So yeah, I, I ring it out every time. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Sometimes like outdoor gigs are very forgiving because you have far less reflective surfaces. You know, you don't have a generally you don't have a roof over your head to, to contend with. You don't have walls around you usually to, you know, to reflect sound back. So you can kind of get away. There's a lot of outdoor gigs where I run the mains flat, sometimes even run the monitors flat on the EQ. Mm -hmm. and, and that's I mean, that's wonderful. <laughs> but, but I don't I don't go in expecting that. It's nice when it happens. 
So, in um, bitter pill, how many people are in in ears? Just the me, just the one. It's me right uh, now. Yeah. In, in fling, how many people are in in ears? All five of us are now. Although we yeah. we've only done one gig that way, and that's that's going to be an interesting evolution this summer. So, yeah. So we're up to nine out of ten, me wow. included, in, in house park. Yeah, and so just. And our, our drummer is open to using his. He has them, and he's used them in the past, our new drummer. So we will be all in-ears, so, so no monitors on stage is interesting. Um, I think Bill posted a, a video from a recent... So we just did a gig where it was a festival gig, and as I've said many times, we don't take a lot of festival gigs because the, the changeovers are yeah. so brief, you know, just hard. Oh, I know. And <laughs> so... As I have said also many times, I wish a bill for everybody listening to this show because Bill does his advanced le- leg work with uh, with the sound companies if the sound is provided. Yep. Um, you know he you know lets them know what we would like to accomplish, engages their interest in in uh, in in doing. Things. We're not quite to the point where we will turn down a gig if we don't think we have enough control. We still would potentially even if there's a sound like no 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 if a sound guy told us you know. We're not comfortable with letting you try to, you know, run your own stage sound uh, on a thirty-minute changeover. You know, we're not. I, I, I haven't turned down a gig because of lack of cooperation from sure. a front of house sound company sure. yet. That might be coming, but anyway. <laughs> so we did this gig, ten-piece band. Bill gets us on stage. You know, largely with love from the ability that you can save your settings on a, on a Midas board yeah. got, gets us pretty close right away. Um, and then just very digital diligently as we're, as we're sound checking our line checking, essentially ourselves, you know, just sees where we are and then just stays with us for the first two or three songs to see if everybody's good. Yep. And we, as a 10 piece band got on stage to our first note in 27 minutes the Whoa. band after us, yeah, the band after us was a five-piece band, all within all within ears. So we were nine out of ten within ears. Five, a five-piece band, and um, and uh, and they were they were uh, ten minutes late, right? So they took forty minutes to, to get on stage. Yeah. So we twenty-seven minutes, and we got done. I think a large part of it is a lot of our guys mix themselves, so that everybody's kind of self-responsible for what they want to hear in their ears. That I I I, I was I was thinking about this. In terms of fling, it's been top of mind because I know we've got some gigs coming up and I know that as a band, we are uh, amateurs at doing in-ears ourselves. I'm not, but having just one guy that knows how to do them doesn't really change things when there's four that just don't have the experience of doing this for, you know, a hundred different venues or 500 different venues or however many different venues it's been. Like, you know, there's some things you just learn over time. That that become automatic, but yeah. I've been I've been thinking about it lately as I've been doing these gigs. Like, oh, I should take notes for the guys in fling. And one of the sort of general, if you know, zoom out to a thousand feet pieces of advice that uh, I I gave to the guys, and I'll share here is you you need to get good at just going and going quickly and dealing with whatever you are handed. So. For me, you know, I get to a gig, I'm thinking of the, the gig we did at the Middle East down in, in Cambridge a couple of weeks ago, where I got there and I politely, you know, asked the engineer, hey, if it's no big deal, can you send me a feed for my ears? And the guy's like, well, if we have time, I'll do that for you. Great. And so he did. And I didn't think twice about what he gave me. It wasn't like, you know, if he had given me a quarter inch or a male XLR or a female XLR, I was ready for that. I I was not, no matter what he gave me, I was not going to ask him to change it to something to suit me. I had all the gear with me that I needed. I can take a quarter inch and feed that into my headphone amp. I can take a, an XLR of either direction and feed that into my headphone amp because I have all the adapters that I've needed because I've been in these scenarios over the years and yeah. It, you know, and so it was like, oh, right. I have this, you know, I call it my just in case now. Right. I have my 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 bag that has all of these sort of little things in it that allow me to be the easy guy. Right. You, you know, and and uh, and so that was my advice to the guys. And that's my advice, you know, here, too, is no matter where you are, if you want to be using in-ears at gigs, use in-ears everywhere, not just to save your hearing, but also to practice 
setting up your in-ears in what I'll call, you know, non-optimal environments. We had a bitter pill rehearsal uh, uh, Sunday, whatever today is, doesn't matter. But we had a bitter pill this rehearsal this weekend and we did it at John's house, our guitar player. And so I thought, oh, it's a good, you know, uh, good opportunity. And so I get there and he's got an old analog mixer, which is totally fine. It, you know, it, it, it served the purpose. And I was like, all right, without screwing up everything he's already doing, how can I tap into this and feed my ears without anyone else needing to be involved, right? And I, and it actually turned out to be pretty easy. I just grabbed the headphone feed off of his off of his mixer and it was mm -hmm. great. But just, you know, doing that in any environment you can will get you up to practice so that you can You have preached this to me for years and years and years and I didn't really get it because I was always fighting it. But yeah. but once I've had a couple, I would actually say it is just around the corner from being second nature to me. Like, that, you know, that's how you hear on stage. All the arguments that I always presented to you, like, well, I need to feel the <laughs> audience. Or I, need to feel, I, I, and you were like, eh, you know, th th these are not impossible or, or, you know, yeah, you these, weren't, these things don't have to be, you weren't wrong just about it. It's done. just, it's just a change. That's all. Yeah. It, that's right. It, it's, it's a comfort level. It, you know what? Interestingly, do you remember uh, about a month ago, I told you I'd had three or four really good in-ear gigs. Yeah. And then I had one was horrible. It was just distorting in my ears and, you know, I just couldn't get a clean, you know, sound. Right. Right. Well, you know, I just assumed because I've had such mixed <laughs> experiences, I just assume this happens once in a while, like, like the process to kind of drill down. So when I finally tell Bill about it, he goes, Oh, and he goes over and sure enough, you know, something had happened and, and, uh, the tran the wireless transmitter for my in-ears, you know, the, the send thing was, was not where it used to be. And that's why he turned it down. And it was back to crystal clear audio again. It was like, and then the last couple of uh, gigs have been fantastic again. So it is, I, I would say this, it's an essential tool. It's yeah. an essential tool if you sing and you want to, you know, preserve your voice. If you if you sing and you'd like to have uh, kind of finesse to the to the way you treat your vocals when you sing, if uh, so so just health wise, it's essential. Um, now I'll say ease of setup, it's essential, yes. right? Yeah, once way you... less weirdness with stage volume, you know, and stage feedback things when those speakers don't exist. Well, think about you know we just answered Eric's question, right? How do you tune your PA? And I said, I start with monitors. Well, I don't start with monitors because of me. I start with monitors because of everybody else on stage. Me, I just plug in and I'm good. I never have to worry about feedback for me, right? Yeah. Because it's, you just plug in and go. So, yeah, once you've got the, you know, the right gear and the right skill, right? Like it is a, it is a skill that, that can be learned and needs to be learned. You need to, you know, yeah. and you need to be self-sufficient, and in whatever your environment is, you, you know, you, you need to be able to do that. Um, yeah. Well, like I said, 10, 10 piece band set up to downbeat in 27 minutes. That's amazing. Pretty powerful. Right? That's amazing yeah. for any band, man. Like I like the kudos to you guys for, for getting that down. That's, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, that's a lot. I and one yep. piece of gear that, that comes to mind that made a huge difference at the, uh, the 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 Middle East gig that I don't think I mentioned when we were talking about it was I recently got a a new headphone amp I got the Rolls PM fifty five P and this is their I talked about what this was a couple of weeks prior this is their battery powered headphone amp now it doesn't have to be battery powered you can you can plug it in and uh, if you don't need to power it off a battery then plugging it in is a good thing but there were no outlets backed by the drum kit. And it was like, wait, I just got this thing yesterday. It's in my bag. I even put a battery in it. Like I just pulled it out. I plugged his feed into, you know, the input. I plugged my headphone uh, cord into the output and boom, everything was golden for the, for the entire set. Uh, I didn't have to worry about like hunting around, finding an outlet, mm -hmm. which could have been a five minute process, right? Like, Hey man, I'm sorry. Do you have an extension cord? Like, you know, now suddenly that derails everything. If I've got to take the single engineer's time to go hunt for an extension cord somewhere that I don't have. Right. And it's like, okay, well this, that made it easy to get things going. Um, so yeah, yeah. I get, it's like, it's interesting. Like, I thought I had all the right gear and I didn't now I do or do I? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or do I? Or do I? Yeah. Well, we're at 35 minutes. Are we, uh, are we digging deeper here or are we, uh, are we going to well, see each know, other next couple, week? Yeah. Yeah. We, we took a couple of weeks off. And so, um, 
I'm going on a hiking trip next week. Oh, so right. We, we're, yeah, we're kind of in our summer, you know, we get to this when we can. I have a few life changes coming up. And so we may have to start recording on Sunday nights or Monday nights, you know, in the future. And, uh, but, you know, dude, seven years, we can't stop now, right? No, I agree. I, I love doing this. It's absolutely worth uh, figuring out whatever the next uh, schedule is for us, because I want to keep doing this for sure. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, and as I say that, you know, the cool comments we get and the gratitude we get from musicians around the world for doing this is really soul filling. So it's just been, it's just fun. And so um, sharing our experiences, hearing about your experiences, the really intelligent questions that we get, super cool comments, again, from musicians all over the world. We're all dealing with the same stuff, more or yeah. less. And so... It's uh, it kind of makes me feel connected to everybody when I'm when I, when things are not going great in my music life that uh, that other people are kind of dealing with stuff as well. It makes me feel, you know, I know you're out there and and uh, and it's great to hear from people. So, oh, one last thing I wanted to tell you about, yeah, man. You know, you know my buddy, my buddy Mel, right? Yeah, I, I was I was thinking about Mel the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mel is my buddy who uh, took up drums about three years ago, and uh, you know, works. He drums at least an hour a day, if not two hours a day. Amazing. And his desire to be to be proficient at an instrument has been admirable. And if you know him, that's that's the way he is. Anyway, his his band called the Canyon Band that he's put together, and we you know we've been going up there. We we've now done our third gig. We just did our last one at a house barbecue, and it, I have to say, it is that rewarding thing when uh, it feels like a band. You, you know, it, it it's hard. It's hard when, even if you say it's just fun, when the music isn't fun, you know, where, yes. where it's, you know, yes. where, where, where people aren't together and, you know, it's not, it, it, it's not effortless, but we played last night. We were well, or on Sunday night, we were well rehearsed. Um, people have put in time, uh, people play together. Uh, it was a lot of smiles from the musicians. The vibe was great. It was a lot of smiles from the people listening. It was just it was really a nice experience. So I got to send kudos to my buddy, Mel. He, he's a, he's an inspiration to me. Cause again, th this is a guy who loves music so much and really wants to be good and really wants to really wants to play. And he wants to, you know, he's got a lot of pride and, and, uh, and uh, he, he's very raw with himself and hard on himself when it's, when he's not learning as fast as he could and he's quickly getting there. So I'm just going to take a couple seconds to say, good job, Mel. It was a great time. Woo. Band sounded fun. And uh, look forward to the next one. That's awesome. I love that. That's great. Yeah. I, uh, I, yeah, it's interesting. I was thinking about Mel the other day cause I had a conversation with him just, you know, about the philosophies uh -huh. of approaching, you know, playing in a, uh, playing the drums essentially. And, uh, I'm glad to hear that he's, he's moving forward. This, uh, oh, that's great. That's good. And well, he's benefited from some really good teachers, you know, who conscientious teachers. And when he kind of has felt that he's kind of hit a wall with a certain teacher, he'll have a good, honest conversation. And he's made some moves. The guy has now, the, 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 actually, he enjoyed having his first drum teacher at the gig on Sunday night. So that wow. was kind of a kick for him. That's yeah, amazing. so yeah, I mean, and I got to imagine his teacher was full of pride to see how far he's come. So that, yeah. that's kind of a cool thing. I bet. Yeah, his teacher now is an excellent drummer. You know, like a really absolutely pro. You know, pro drummer and a pro teacher, which are two different things, right? Yes. Oh, um, yeah, 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 for sure. So, yeah, yeah. That's so great. E even people who have played for a while, I will say that for me, you know, playing with some pretty good guys for for many years now. Playing with someone who loves it so much is still inspiring. So, you know, even even if they're in a different place on the curve of proficiency or, or experience, actually, playing with someone who really wants to be good is still an inspiring thing. It, and uh, yeah, I and yeah. I yeah, that it's that's an that's a really interesting observation because I I mean I've certainly noticed that about musicians I played with, but I've also noticed it about myself. There have been times where I have for whatever reason, lost that drive or that focus on improving and am just, you know, coasting a little bit. Uh, yep. I, I am thankfully in a push to get better. I, I, I mean, I, I think last couple of years has been that way for me anyway, but certainly the, uh, the, res the spectacular results of that surgery I had on my arm have mm -hmm. inspired me to be like, okay, like I can, you know, cause I kind of had to, do some playing to, to get back up to speed after, you know, after having that surgery. And right. it's been amazing 
watching how how much I can improve just by working on things. I, I know that's super obvious to say, <laughs> right? But but it there's something about it that that really sparked me uh, this time around, and so it's like I'm I'm driven to play. I have a a drum pad right next to my desk, so when I'm on hold or even when I'm not on hold, sometimes I I just grab sticks and I you know I play. If people hear drums tapping in the background on a conference call, it's it's not me, I swear, but uh, but it might be me. So yeah, it's good. It yeah, it's good to be to have that to have that drive. Musical inspiration can come from different places. Yeah, it can come from playing with people who are way better than you. That's one type of inspiration. It can come from playing to an audience that is just incredibly appreciative. You know, as you're finding new things about your skills and, you know, you you play and it connects with people in a certain way, that can be really inspiring. But again, playing with people who love music, um, playing people who are determined and show that determination through hard work, that's a different type of inspiring. It's all, but just as, just as useful. Yep. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Good stuff. I want to, I want to give a shout out to Andrew, our, our uh, sax player in the, uh, speaking in tongues, the talking heads project. He stopped me on my way out of rehearsal last night. He's like, are you still doing that podcast? I said, yeah. And he said, you know, man, I, like I listened to that show for a while. He says, I, I guess he hadn't listened for a little bit, but he said that you made some comment about, uh, you know, when you're a sub going in, you have to go in and play like you don't try to play like the guy that you're subbing for because you'll be in your head all night and it, you know, yeah. you won't be confident and all that. He's like, that blew my mind. He's like, I never thought about it that way. And, it, you know, it was like it was so wonderful to hear that that some comment and discussion that you and I had really made a difference for somebody else. It, these discussions certainly make a difference for me. Right. Talking through all this stuff absolutely helps me hone my craft just by talking about it. And so to have this, you know, the side effect of it helping someone out there, even just one person is like you said, it's inspiring. And so that's another way to, to be inspired, to keep pushing along for, sure. for this different craft that we have. That's, you know, all related. So, yeah, for sure. All right, folks. Well, thank you so much for listening. Thanks for hanging out with us. Paul, it's been a few weeks. I forget. What, what is that thing that we say? Always be performing. Always. We'll see you next time. I think it's going to be two weeks. We'll see you.